Udacast, informing your decisions with intelligence, analysis, and insight. Brought to you by the team at OodaLoop.com. Hi, I'm Matt DeVoe, CEO of Uda, And on this Udacast, we're talking with Scott Shumate, who has 30 plus year career in profiling interesting individuals, whether they be national leaders, uh, terrorists, or insider threats. So Scott, welcome to the Udacast, and love for you to give uh, our watchers and listeners a bit about your background. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, it's good to be here. <clears throat> I, uh, I've actually had a, a very intriguing uh, career actually, but, and, and I've been very lucky, but uh, I worked, uh, first uh, in the career as uh, for 19 years with uh, the Central Intelligence Agency as an undercover officer uh, doing uh, operational psychology. And, uh, you know, when I say that, most people think, okay, a psychologist sitting at a desk, smoking a pipe and uh, rubbing his chin or and uh, listening to people talk about things. And, uh, you can remove all of it except for listening to people talk um, uh, very much out in the field and uh, had, have had the opportunity to meet uh, literally thousands of uh, people of interest uh, to the United States government and or, uh, you know, a recruited asset and or ones that we were trying to recruit. And, um, what I can tell you is, uh, I know I see these uh, things that people believe that, uh, you know, like narcissism is the, uh, and number one, uh, reason why people become spies. And, uh, I can't tell you how fervently I disagree with that, but, um, <clears throat> So I worked for the agency for uh, 19 years, the very end, uh, got involved uh, uh, with the enhanced interrogation techniques and, uh, and uh, terrorism uh, uh, suspects. And uh, then uh, got an offer from uh, the Department of Defense uh, for a senior executive position. And so I left DO or I left CIA and went to DOD and uh, started uh, working for them uh, in counterintelligence, which is not intelligence. And uh, it was quite a wrap up uh, there, or, you know, to get uh, on top of everything. And uh, the other thing that I found fascinating is uh, the DOD people can. Uh, hold complete conversations without ever really using a recognized word of English yeah, <laughs> because they have all of the, uh, uh, I got brain fog, like, like you were talking about earlier. Um, all the acronyms and acronyms. yeah, complexity. Yeah. yeah acronyms. So, <clears throat> um, I did that for four years and then, uh, retired, uh, from the government and then I was uh, walking around downtown, just kind of wandering around and uh, ran into a guy that I served with the agency that was an FBI agent. And he said, hey, what are you doing? And uh, so we started talking and he said, would you be willing to come on contract to the FBI? And uh, uh and I said, yeah, because what they were wanting to do is increase their assets and being able to recruit assets uh, to provide information. And that's right up my ballywick. And so <clears throat> I worked uh, for the FBI as a contractor for uh, seven years. And we got involved in a variety of fascinating cases with them and uh, got to know uh, many of the uh, FBI agents. And now uh, I'm uh, putting together a book on uh, insider threat, and uh, I view it very differently than what uh, uh, most people uh, see it, uh, because I was, in essence, involved in creating insiders in foreign governments, and uh, a lot of the 
assumptions that are currently believed to be uh, absolute truisms I don't agree with. Um, and, uh, you know, it was actually kind of interesting because when I first started at the agency, the thing that I found most fascinating is I'd, I'd gone through a very good uh, doctoral program. And uh, in fact, so good that after 19 years with the agency, I went to take the licensing exam and passed it, um, which, you know, it said more about my education than it does about me. So, <laughs> uh, you know, it was a very good university. But at any rate, the, uh, uh, the thing that I found fascinating <clears throat> is i had been trained <clears throat> to look at pathology. Right. And so then, uh, you know, you start to work at the agency and you're targeting, uh, you know, high level people in, in foreign governments and, and uh, you know, a lot of other people. And the overwhelming majority of them are, you know, quote unquote, normal, uh, high functioning people. And and, you know, psychology defines uh, the, the, the personality disorders, uh, you know, uh, in, in with certain criteria and, uh, how, how normal is determined is by the absence of pathology. <clears throat> well, if you've ever had any kind of scientific training, you realize that that is an absurd concept. Uh, <laughs> and, um, so, you know, you really had to learn what it means to be normal and, you know, how do you make distinctions? And so uh, I came up with uh, a different way over, over the years. I came up with a different uh, way of looking at people. And uh, I really don't tend to use uh, personality uh, disorders because it's so rare to really come across uh, those people. And I know a lot of people will argue against that. But, but you know, narcissism is oftentimes used uh, to try to describe uh, Vladimir Putin. And I've never met Vladimir Putin, but I have watched him, um, you know, on TV and, you know, read about him and so forth. And uh, so, you know, if you want to look at it, is he narcissistic? Well, uh, yes. Uh, is, uh, is he a narcissist? Uh, probably. Uh, by the definitions that uh, are, uh, you know, have been researched and so forth. But you have to understand that the personality disorders that have been researched only account for about 9% of the population. And so you got really 91% of the population that is, in essence, normal because they lack pathology. And if you get to know most of us in that 91%, you begin to recognize uh, there's a lot of pathology, <laughs> uh, you know, and, but we just don't see it in the same light. And so in, in that way, you know, Putin is uh, narcissistic, but what I like to see it is, is, you know, what has changed in his context and context is everything that goes on in the world around him or any of us, as far as that goes. And I, I guess the, and, and then you come into a situation and what, what happens is you rely on past experiences to understand the, how to cope with a new problem or new issue, a new set of, a, of circumstances. You use those as previous examples or, or experiences that you had to try to understand what to do. I'll give you a quick example. I was uh, coming back to the States and uh, I arrived late at Dulles uh, one night. And uh, so I was going through Tyson's Corner and a light uh, wasn't working. And I'm sitting there and literally there's no traffic you know, in, from any direction. And so I'm sitting there waiting for that light to change. And, and, it, and I didn't really want to get a ticket for a variety of reasons. And so uh, the, um, <clears throat> so I'm sitting there and, and finally uh, a police officer pulls up next to me and he's waiting for the light to change also. And so, you know, I thought he probably had recognized that I'd been there for a while. And, and so uh, I finally looked at him and kind of went, you know, like, 
you know, the, the light's broken, you know, it's, going, you know, and it's broken. And so I thought he registered what I said. And so I took off. Well, he immediately turned on his lights and pulled me over <laughs> and uh, gave me a ticket. But that's a perfect example of how do you confront a situation that isn't resolving the way that you're thinking it's going to resolve. You look for past experiences to try to understand what to do. And we do that all the time, uh, constantly. In fact, uh, we use people you know, to help us understand what to do, uh, not just by talking to them, but also mostly by watching them. So with context, we, we, get, we get these situations that we have to deal with, and, and so we have to try to figure out what to do. And uh, an example that in certainly my generation, and I believe even the younger generations of today have probably watched uh, a classic movie uh, uh, called Animal House. And uh, I, I kind of like that movie. Um, but uh, they have a scene in there that uh, is kind of fascinating. It's kind of a provocative uh, thing, but uh, what I like about it is it shows how we try to evaluate each situation basically between two poles. Is it a good idea or is it a bad idea? And in that movie, they have Pinto, which was one of the characters, and he has a young gal uh, who's been inebriated, passed out, in his room and he's trying to make a decision what he's going to do, the right thing or the wrong thing. And they represent that by having an angel and a devil, one on each shoulder, you know, yelling at him about what he ought to do. And what makes that funny is that's exactly what's happening in most circumstances. I don't know about the angel and the devil, but the idea that you're trying to evaluate between a good idea and a bad idea. And what should you do is your actions good or bad. Well, in Putin's case, you know, uh, um, his context had uh, changed considerably. I mean, uh, he he eventually, uh, you know, gets himself into uh, a lot of power and is able to uh, finagle uh, the, the system so that he's uh, kind of the president forever and, uh, you know, uh, rules with an iron fist. And uh, that is something else, and we'll talk about that kind of stuff here in a, in a bit. But um, so, you know, he's got himself into a lot of power. People are scared of him. They don't want to speak up. And um, so what, you know, they don't want to go against what his wishes are because they're fearful of the repercussions to their career or even potentially their life. And so they tend to, you know, squelch uh, dissent and so forth. And he sees power as uh, very important. And and generally humans, when you get power, you um, cherish it and you don't want to give it up. You want more power. It's kind of an unending cycle. And so he's gotten himself into, you know, a position of a great deal of power in Russia. And uh, then he's looking out at the world, his context, because he's a world player, maybe not to the level that he would like, but that's another story. But he's a, a world player and he is watching things uh, around the globe that are happening that are like Pinto, you know, positive, negative is this you know, good, bad, how do I want to evaluate it? How do I want to engage it? And he sees some very powerful things happening that have, you know, tremendous influence. And I think they have tremendous influence on him today. And some of it has to do with the United States. Some of it has to do with NATO. Some of it has to do with Russia itself and the economic conditions. <clears throat> And who knows exactly what the political conditions are in Russia right now and how much that's important in his decision making. But, you know, he looks at it and he sees the United States, which has been his primary enemy forever. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, Khrushchev, back in the early 60s, late 50s, uh, made the comment that, um, you know, 
we would take down, that the Russians would, the Soviet Union would take down the uh, United States without ever firing a shot. And the way that they were, you know, trying to design it is to get us to be divided and go after ourselves. And, you know, if you're from that model, Soviet Union slash now Russia, you don't understand democracy, right? Because all you see is somebody who's got power and they willed it completely. Mm-hmm. And so you're not going to get any arguments from people and, and counter positions and so forth. And if you do, you remove them. Well, here in the United States, uh, you know, we see, you know, democracy is a messy affair. And so <clears throat> this is what he grew up with. This is what he knows. He was a KGB agent or actually a FSB uh, agent. Um, which is under the KGB counterintelligence. But so uh, that's what he grew up with. And he sees the United States and there, you know, and he's always disliked the United States. He thinks that we're, you know, soft and we are misguided and, uh, and so forth. And he sees some fascinating things happen. He sees uh, president Obama, the first African-American to be elected into the White House. Well, if you're a Russian, and especially if you're of the ruling uh, um, elite, uh, you're extremely bigoted. And, you know, uh, they tend to look down on African Americans and have a very pejorative uh, view. And so all of a sudden, here's this African American who's extremely bright. Uh, you know, got a great uh, educational background in the White House. You know, he's probably going to see that as a sign of degradation in America in some way. <clears throat> and then you see, he sees, you know, a variety of other things occurring. He sees uh, that uh, the election of Trump right after that, who, you know, comes across in, uh, you know, uh, very uh, strong terms or tries to look strong. And, and, uh, you know, I'm not trying to get into politics here in the United States, but quite the opposite of just about any president that we'd had previously and how he went about things. And as it turns out, uh, he develops a very peculiar relationship with uh, Putin. Actually, I think Putin just uh, built that relationship up with Trump. And I can see why Putin would. And, uh, you know, uh, was he, you know, some people have alleged that uh, Trump was an asset of Russia. You know, it'd be hard to ever figure that out. Um, but there certainly was a very cooperative kind of relationship with, uh, with Putin. And Putin was probably involved at some level with Trump's decision to kind of grate on NATO and cause additional dissatisfactions and conflicts there. And so NATO all of a sudden gets weak. Well, the Russians hate NATO and have hated NATO because of what it represents, a guardrail to to them. And so all these things are taking place. And then all of a sudden, here it is, COVID time, and you get isolated. Well, the worst thing for anybody is to get isolated because if you're prone to love your own thoughts, after a while you really have a love fair going on because uh, all you've got is your own thoughts. And if you've got uh, thoughts of ruling the world, and and I don't know if, if uh, Putin has uh, you know desires to rule the world, but he absolutely has a couple of thoughts that are very important to how he functions. One is that he wants to see the reestablishment of the Soviet Union when the Soviet Union was a major geopolitical player. And uh, he also, you know, like anybody, you know, he's now, I guess, in his late 60s or early 70s, uh, he... uh, you know, he recognizes that time is starting to run out on his being able 
to you know establish himself as one of the great rulers of of Russia, and uh, you know he idolized uh, Stalin. He really didn't uh, like Lenin. His dad evidently worked for Lenin, and uh, but he uh, he desperately wants to be seen as a historical figure for Russia or the Soviet Union. And so, you know, he fixates on this while he's isolated and, uh, you know, he's a smart man and, uh, you know, he gets himself revved up and nobody's there to tell him that uh, what he's thinking is probably not doable, at least not the way that he wants. And then, uh, you know, uh, so COVID continues. Uh, he sees divisions in the United States, and uh, he sees January 6th. I mean, he must have been celebrating uh, when January 6th uh, occurred. And finally, I think one of the other major events uh, externally to Russia was is the uh, withdrawal of uh, American troops from Afghanistan. It did not look good as to how that took place. And he would see all that as weakness. And so uh, here he goes. You know, he decides that he's going to take over Ukraine. And, uh, you know, from all accounts, it looks like he believed that he could do that pretty rapidly and that he'd actually be welcomed into, um, into uh, Ukraine. And uh, he wasn't. He wasn't welcomed. And here we are now. And we got what I find fascinating about it is most politicians, and at the, and the ultimate heart of it, uh, Putin's a politician, yeah, and he needs to survive uh, to be able to, uh, you know, keep ruling, keep that power. Uh, he doesn't have any apparent offer, yeah, and that makes him a very dangerous person in this situation because. The worst thing for a guy who thinks the world of himself and uh, wants to become, uh, you know, one of the uh, most important people in the history of uh, Russia slash Soviet Union is all of a sudden to have defeat, humiliation. And so uh, I think he's a very dangerous man at this point because uh, it's evidently not going well. And... I think we're going to see him continuing to uh, to press, and so you know it's the it, it's the context that drives the behavior, and in his world, as he sees the context as he's viewing it, and what what's fascinating is we all as people don't say, okay, well, let me take in all the data. Now, some people say they do, but believe me, they don't. You know, some take in more. Some take in very little, uh, which is also kind of fascinating. But what ends up happening is they look for selective information in the environment and use it in their particular way that they're going to. Because all of us have cognitive biases. These biases that we rely on are, in essence, subroutines. They're shortcuts. And so when we see a little bit of information, we can jump to a conclusion, and that conclusion is based on our cognitive bias. And we have multiple, many cognitive biases that each of us have in different ways, different ratios. And so some people are, see a situation and they see danger in it. Some see things and see it as uh, exciting opportunity. And so we, uh, and there's, you know, literally uh, hundreds and hundreds of recognized cognitive biases that, uh, that we as humans have, and they're very resilient. And so what ends up happening is we interpret the world based on, uh, if you're a big geopolitical player, or if you're, you know, just, uh, somebody, uh, living, uh, you know, wherever in the world, we interpret what's going on around us through these cognitive biases, because if we didn't, we'd be overwhelmed. Yeah. Okay. 
there's just too damn much information. And in fact, nowadays there's a hell of a lot more information that's easily, uh, you know, found and, and, and received. And yet you, with all this added uh, information, we get spoofed by, you know, these, uh, uh, co- um, I'm blanking this morning for some reason, uh, uh, competitive, uh, you know, these, these, uh, theories, the conspiratorial theories, conspiracy, mm-hmm. there we go. And, uh, we get spoofed by them, even though we've got, you know, information at, at the ready on the internet mm-hmm. and you'll see people go, they'll, they'll go digging for information. And what do they bring you? They bring you, you know, something that is absolutely supports the bias. Yeah. It just supports <laughs> the bias. It's just trash, you know, and yeah. nobody else is, you know, jumping on it except for a few people. And because they kind of associate loose groups, you know, with this stuff, they see it as being reified that they've got this, uh, you know, magic information that, that no one else is paying attention to. But it, it's all these cognitive biases that get in, in the way. And so for him, uh, you know, his bias is that he wants to be in charge and he desperately wants to be, you know, idolized and to be uh, seen historically important. And the other thing that, that is also true. And, you know, we see the reporting, we, you see it on TV. You say, how could he do this? You know, how could he be so cruel? How could he do this? Well, having lived and spent most of my adult life overseas, what I can tell you is and we all fall prey to it. We say, there's no way they could do that because that's not what I would do. <laughs> sure. Don't ever use yourself as a barometer of normalcy. Okay? Yeah. Because I'm telling you, you know, uh, it, it's astounding how people see things uh, very differently. And um, in his world, being Russian, as many Russians have said to me, we're not like you. And yeah. as you get to know them, you recognize they don't. They aren't mm-hmm. exactly like us. Are they human? Yeah, of course. We're all human on, on the earth. And so you'd sit there and say, well, or, or there may be a few conspiracy theories that ha- allege that there's some aliens living here. <laughs> but, but for the best knowledge of everybody, uh, we're all humans here on, on the earth. And and so, um, uh, because we're all human, you know, we bleed the same, we live the same more or less than we die. But other than that, we're very different. If you're Russian, you believe in power. You don't have a great deal of concern about individual life. Like, you know, in the United States, I mean, it, it's astounding. And, and you hear people overseas that they're A, impressed or, you know, can't believe it. But they'll, you know, all of a sudden uh, there's a, a air attack, some kind of a bombing and uh, or, you know, cruise missile or whatever. And, and then a child or, you know, a family will get killed, uh, innocent, uh, you know, collateral damage. And... Uh, you know, the U S military takes it very seriously and the United States government tends to take it very seriously. And so, you know, p- other people around the world can't understand that. that is, it's like, why yeah. do you spend all that time? Right. So it seems like, you know, from, from what I'm hearing that a, he's got, he's got power within Russia. He has money, uh, more than he'll ever spend, even despite the sanctions, you know, there's, there's no way that that's going to be financially impactful to him uh, over time, but what he doesn't have is the legacy. So, you know, now he's hitting 70 years old, looking to establish some sort of legacy and that that could be a primary motivator for his behavior. Uh, and as you mentioned, you know, is a narcissist and has surrounded himself at least by people who believe he's a narcissist. Uh, All you have to do is watch Putin play hockey to recognize the 
the fact that kind of the deference that the people around him provide him, uh, you know, he scores 10 goals and is the star of the game. And it's just kind of ridiculousness, uh, <clears throat> almost on par with what we see out of North Korea. So <clears throat> do you think from his perspective that, you know, given his legacy uh, in the Soviet Union as an intelligence officer encountering the United States and then seeing the collapse of the Soviet Union and the impact that had on him personally, his ability to manipulate uh, the system and rise to power uh, and put himself in kind of permanent power. Do you think that he views himself as at war with the West or is this just a simple, how far can I push the boundaries in order to establish some sense of legacy? <clears throat> yeah, that, that's an excellent question, Matt. And, uh, uh, you know, I don't know exactly how far he takes it, but I do, I do believe that he has aspirations. Now, will he go after that? I, you know, uh, we'd need uh, up-to-date intelligence to sure. de determine this, but... I do believe that he would like to reconsolidate the Soviet Union. Yeah. And that would be his legacy. And that would be his legacy. Now, would he want to expand further out? Like I said, power is corrupting. Mm -hmm. Absolute power, you know, dangerous. Yeah. And uh, in Russia, you know, he's, uh, I mean, he, he's got a self feedback loop that is only reifying everything that he believes. There isn't going to be somebody who's going to stand up and say, boss, I'm telling you, I think you're hundred percent wrong. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, this is not the way to go. They're not going to do that. Why? Mm -hmm. It's politically dangerous. It's physically dangerous. He, he, he removes uh, opposition. Yeah. Right. He, do you think that he'll be escalatory given that he doesn't appear to be suicidal? I mean, you watch him sitting 30 feet away from people and seems to have developed some paranoia around his personal safety. Um, do you think that'll lead him to kind of be constrained within this kind of ground or, or cyber war perspective? Or would he escalate to the point where he would start to consider the use of tactical nuclear weapons uh, if it you know, fit into this narrative of building a legacy and reuniting the Soviet Union? Yeah, uh, uh, absolutely uh, valuable question. But, um, he's not likely to commit suicide. Okay, the only place where he would be most likely to commit suicide is when things start to get to a point of humiliation for, of him. And, uh, you know, we're not, not there. He doesn't look uh, effective. He doesn't look all that powerful uh, right now. <clears throat> But he is not a high risk for suicide. Yeah, it was he, more suicidal behavior, right? Something that would escalate to the point of no return. So you don't think he's at that stage yet? No, no. It, I think the only time that that will, will uh, could potentially come into play is if he, uh, you know, starts to have to retreat and. Uh, he uh, gets nothing out of this, and there is uh, increased opposition at home, and uh, you know he looks weak and ineffective. Uh, that's when there may be a potential for you know him uh, okay. taking his own life. But in between that, before that, uh, he wants to strike out and. <laughs> Uh, you know, he seems to have very few guardrails around him. And what is really fascinating about human behavior is we need guardrails. If we don't have these guardrails that will kind of keep us in the playing field, we will go astray very rapidly. And having seen people in uh, chaotic combat kind of situations, and most military leaders recognize this is you start to see movement away from what is acceptable behavior, you know, culturally. And uh, so you always have to put the guardrails in place structurally to keep people from uh, going too far astray. Mm -hmm. And his guardrails appear to be loose. Um, and so I think that he is, um, 
you know, uh, I, I think he's a very dangerous man uh, he, right now. He seems to be intentionally removing the guardrails as well. You know, for example, with regards to the economic sanctions, you know, him stating that those are akin to an act of war seems to open up the guardrails for, you know, counter actions against the United States and other, and I'm particularly interested in the kind of the cyber domain. It seems really the best non escalatory path that he has with regards to countering the sanctions is to engage in cyber attacks uh, against uh, Western infrastructure, in particular, the financial infrastructure, a kind of, you know, if I can't have access to the global economy, neither can you, do you think that he'll stay within those kind of comparable guardrails or will he escalate further, you know, given that he's articulated, this is akin to an act of war. I, uh, yeah. Uh, once again, very good question. Uh, it's speculative on my behalf, of course, sure. but um, <clears throat> it's, uh, I, I, I think uh, he will certainly engage. He, he probably has already engaged at some level with the cyber attacks and uh, in the financial markets, especially as those sanctions uh, really grab hold, I believe that it will become increasingly likely that uh, companies and countries will uh, get hit by the cyber uh, warfare that uh, the Russians, uh, you know, are pretty good at. Yeah. And, you know, we're pretty good at it, too. But the... Uh, uh, and we don't read about that. But it, it speaks to that different heart. And you know, it's not uh, it's not comparable. And this kind of gets to your, you know, never evaluate uh, others based on our own conditions in which we live in. I think the Russians probably view themselves as much more resilient to cyber warfare because the Russian people are more resilient, whereas the U.S. is considered to be soft and would be more impactful. So there's a little bit of a disproportionate impact there that I think is perceived from a cyber perspective. So uh, I'm, I'm very curious, you know, it's been interesting that he hasn't escalated the cyber attack aspects to date, you know, and I'm kind of waiting for what is that trigger? You mentioned the humiliation. He's certainly being humiliated yeah. uh, in the world. He's been able to insulate the Russian citizens from that humiliation. But gosh, I mean, my teenage kids come home with new Putin jokes every day. Um, <laughs> yeah, there, sure. there are memes and, you know, there, there's definitely... Uh, an activity in our a global activity to kind of get under his skin or demonstrate that, you know, that he is not powerful, uh, that this is not going well for him, you know, and even just to, in generally insulting towards him. So obviously he's not reading the internet and seeing what jokes teenagers are sharing, but, you know, this is this kind of global concerted disrespect for him uh, that is driving some of that humiliation. It feels like, yeah. um, well, you know, as, as, again, you know, he, he got an opportunity to view uh, the world uh, and then distort it in his mind, the way that he, you know, all of us do, but in the way that he does for himself. And, you know, he, he's looking and, and he sees that the United States and, and Western Europe in particular are having problems getting people to wear masks. Mm -hmm. Right. And he sees that. And, you know, he's going to see that as these people are just weak. They, they can't they can't adapt. They don't know what life is really like. You know, life is hard. They get upset because they have to wear a mask. And and so he sees these kind of things and that, you know, influences him further as to that he's going to be able to manipulate uh, the West. And, uh, you know, what exactly the relationship was with Trump, uh, you know, we'll probably never know. But, uh, you know, he probably sees it as that he looked absolutely strong. He's got the American president who appears to be unusually cooperative with, uh, you know, a Russian ruler who's doing all sorts of stuff, cyber attacks and getting away with it and, and so forth. And at least, you know, not being regressed about it. And so, you know, he, he probably sees us as weak in wanting to uh, take advantage of that. And, you know, I mean, the, the thing that used to always strike me about Soviets is, you know, <laughs> you know, they, it's a, uh, well, you know, if you came, brought them to the States or, or whatever, and you'd say, uh, well, let's get some cheese. And, uh, you know, they, they would be just astounded 
you know, because if you go into a grocery store or a deli, you know, you know, how did you, what yeah. did you did you want it grated? You want it sliced? You want it diced? You know, do you want it yellow? You want it white? Do you, you know, what flavor sure. do you want it? How much of it do you want? Because when you're when you were in the Soviet Union, you went to the cheese shop and you said cheese, mm-hmm. and whatever the cheese was that day, that's what you got. No, yep. right? And uh, you know, for us, you know, we had to. It has to be pre-sliced. You know, somebody has to do that for us. You know, you look, you you're in a different situation. And you're look, you look different, and uh, and so you know he's got a very biased view about the West and about us. And you know one of the other uh, con- contextual things that happened is Angela Mar- uh, Merkel, uh, you know, stepped down, mm-hmm. and uh, you know she she's a fascinating woman, you know, very bright woman, and uh, you know very very good leader. And she was born in the West, uh, Western Germany. And uh, her father uh, was a preacher and moved to uh, East, uh, East Germany when it was under communist rule. That's where she grew up you know, as a teenager, you know, and early adulthood was in uh, East Germany. And so she knows the communist way. She knows the Soviet bloc way. And so she resigns, you know, or steps down, retires. And for him, he had to see that as a green light. Yeah. He's, um, yeah. So, I mean, there's lots of factors, as you mentioned, coming into play, you know, this, the sense of legacy, the isolation from COVID, uh, the, the world kind of global stage, the w- removal of troops from Afghanistan and kind of how that was botched. Uh, but I think if we're, if we're being honest, I think our, our tolerance for his current activities is, you know, only in place because of the fact that they're a nuclear power. And he seems to, you know, increasingly want to demonstrate that fact to the world. Uh, he's having parades with nuclear weapons on display. Uh, do you think that he might escalate that demonstration or reminder to the world that they are a nuclear power and engage in, you know, maybe an atmosphere test uh, of a nuclear weapon or something that that is a little bit, you know, not used in targeting another country, but is a reminder to the globe of the fact that they are a nuclear power and that that, that allows them basically to project power uh, in regions of interest to them. Do, do you think we'll see increasingly erratic, uh, you know, demonstrations of power or even things that step into that that realm of global condemnation with regards to testing nuclear weapons in, in unexpected or unanticipated ways? Yes. Uh, the short answer is yes. yes. I mean, it's not only that he has nuclear weapons, but he also has delivery systems that yeah. uh, are, uh, you know, very problematic because uh, that increases his reach and his abilities. And yes, he will uh, use it. And he, yes, he is threatening. And of course that, you know, for, for NATO and for the United States right now, when he threatens uh, nuclear, uh, you know, offhanded, it looks like an offhanded comment, uh, but nothing's offhanded. He's doing it, uh, for, with intent, uh, or I believe. Yeah. And, uh, it's a deterrence, right? I mean, it's classical deterrence to remind us or to, to demonstrate that he's still enamored with the fact that they are a, a global nuclear power. Yeah. He's sending a message saying, you know, be careful. That is the, the only reason, you know, in my belief that, that we don't enforce a no fly zone over the Ukraine or haven't been more active in, in helping defend the civil, civilian population there is the fact that he is a nuclear power. So it seems like he'll want to increasingly remind us and demonstrate that fact. Well, yeah, safe, uh, no, no fly zone is a real problem. I mean, if uh, I was a Ukrainian uh, and in Ukraine right now, I'd really wish there was a uh, no fly zone. But uh, in reality, uh, for the rest of us that aren't uh, there, um, I mean, this thing could really turn into World War III. Yeah. Do you think he's a rational actor at this point, or have we reached the point of no return? You know, is there ever a situation where he, he, he comes to grips with the reality that he's confronted with, or do we con- continue to see just increasingly irrational behavior? Okay. 
before I answer that, which is a good question, but before mm-hmm. I answer that, I, I want people to realize that humans are not logical. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Yep. Okay. So some people, you know, will say, Oh, I'm very logical. Well, okay. Well, uh, you know, that yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> you know, a variety of things that they're doing that are not logical, but uh, people are not logical. Now that's not the same as rational. What, what being rational means is that you're, you have control of your faculties that you have the ability to evaluate information. And once again, I've already pointed out that humans have a disposition of limiting what information they look at (laughs) and then accept. And some people have a very low openness to new ideas, openness to new information and so forth. Is he rational? Yes, he is rational in the sense that evaluating info, he, he can evaluate the info that's being put towards him. Does he have biases? Does he have you know disruptions in in being able to look at it uh, and say you know what am I really doing here? Because uh, the thing that I really have a hard time understanding, and this is why I think some people think that he may not be rational, is he doesn't have an apparent off ramp. Yeah. Right. I mean, he's got himself you know, caught in between a rock and a hard place right now. And so, you know, what's he going to do? Is he, is he going to stand up and all of a sudden say, Oh, (laughs) sorry guys, I, I messed up, you know? No, he he can't do that. He can't do that because his ego for one, two, it would completely humiliate him or he'd humiliate himself really. Right. And so, so he can't do that. So his only other course of action is to, keep doubling down and doubling down is scary when you see somebody who has nuclear weapons and the ability to deliver them. And so you have to take those threats seriously, even if quite frankly, I believe most of it is an attempt to influence and not a serious offer. Yeah. That's interesting. So, I mean, basically we're at the point of no return then with Ukraine, they're going to be in a protracted war with Russia uh, until it's resolved in some capacity. Yeah. 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 Do you think his ability to control the information flow to the Russian people gives him a potential on ramp? Uh, They are, you know, um, they're not seeing the reality of what's happening and the civilian targeting and kind of the, the, moving away from what he articulates as the primary mission in the Ukraine. Uh, do you think that he could just declare a win and say, Hey, we went in and, you know, we secured the Russian population in these regions and we're happy with how things went. And now we're withdrawing. Obviously we'd be humiliated on the global stage, but it seems like that he could manage the level of humiliation amongst his own population. Uh, or is that something that's just not going to be taken into consideration now over this sense of legacy and the fact that he would be humiliated globally, if not within his own country, because he controls the information flow. Well, if you're trying to establish a legacy, uh, you know, uh, there has to be an accomplishment. There has to be an accomplishment. I mean, uh, because if you lay it out on a weak set of cards that are not going to win many hands, uh, over time, uh, it will be clear that those were weak hands and there's no way that's, you know, what it actually got accomplished. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the idea of how uh, influential propaganda is, I mean, he is using propaganda. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And very well. I mean, that's a, that's a Soviet strength. I mean, they, uh, and now Russian strength, mm-hmm. is that, um, you know, they really use propaganda. Their people, the vast majority of them, again, you can get exposed to the truth, but when you grow up in a world where you don't really know what the truth is, it's hard to determine what the truth is. Right? And you're already biased, right? I mean, uh, you're already biased. And, and from you, your lifetime. You, yeah. And yeah. You know, and so people believe what they're being told. And uh, I mean, you saw that in the January 6th thing. I mean, if, if Americans ever have questions about the effectiveness of propaganda, I mean, we too play, got played. Mm-hmm. 
from the propaganda, right? And uh, it's very powerful. And and I would say that uh, Putin and the people he's got in place are very good at um, orchestrating and uh, grooming the message that, that goes out. And so what you end up seeing is people, you know, I saw a guy on the television last night who called his father in Russia and he was living in Ukraine and, and trying to explain it to him. The father disregarded completely what the son was saying and believed with the state media, right? Yeah. And, and so you sit there and you say, wow, that's powerful. That's very powerful for that to happen. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Fascinating. But I, I, uh, we met first in, you know, a counterterrorism context back in the terrorism research center days. I'm sure we could have a whole separate conversation on that. So I appreciate you taking the time to talk about Putin and share your insights, you know, given that it's so timely uh, in impacting us all. Uh, any parting words or one thing that I always like to ask as well as if there's a book that you would recommend or something that you've read recently, whether on this topic or, or another topic that you would like to share with the audience? Well, uh, as far as books go, I I, uh, I actually just got just finished reading Why Democracies Die, and uh, that was uh, you know uh, it, it was a good book. I mean there were there were sections in there that uh, I thought it was a little too germane to American political situations, uh, mm. but um, but I, I thought it was a good book, and uh, and. What it really tells you, and, and, and they're very good at, at describing this in all sorts of conditions around the world, is if you don't have guardrails, you know, systemically built in, uh, people get past them, those mm -hmm. boundaries. And once they're past those boundaries, it's really hard to come back. Yeah, interesting. And, uh, and so that book is, yeah, I think it, it, it's a good read. And uh, so, uh, you know, I would certainly recommend that book, but, um, <clears throat> just that we are in a very dangerous situation here and, um, I don't know if the American people are fully aware of how dangerous and how many tripwires there are that could ignite not only uh, Russia, because they're the aggravator here, mm. but China and uh, a multitude of other smaller countries. And uh, it's dangerous. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I agree. So thank you for sharing your perspective. Uh, appreciate it as always, and look forward to chatting with you again soon. Okay, Matt, thanks for having me. Good luck. Thanks for listening to this OODA Loop production. For the latest analysis on cybersecurity, technology, and global risks, please visit www.oodaloop.com.